Hey, salute. Salute. We all ran right down here from WhiskeyCon, so sorry if we're overdressed. And who, who better than, you know, to have a bunch of overdressed people than to do dangerous chemical things and fire on stage? So yes, yes, while drinking more whiskey, because, okay, why not, I can't feel pain, it's fine. So this talk is about, there, there will be some fire, not big open pit fire like this, but there will be minor fire, there will be metals, many of which are not safe. Of course, I brought enough for the rest of the class. So yes, if, uh, if you haven't met me, I've been to a number of Kakalaki cons in the past. I do covert entry work. I do physical entry work. My team and I break into places. That's what we do. Uh, we get places we're not supposed to be. And it is a fun job. It is a really good time. Uh, if you can get the work, by all means, try it. Because, you know, I, like, I don't belong in there. I'm going to hurt something in there. I shouldn't be in there at all. I'm a, that's, a, that's an entire liability situation. Way worse than anything here. Now, when people think about you know, what I do, and they talk to me a lot, and if you've been with Patrick and the rest of the crew, and the lock, who's been to Lockpick Room? Lockpick Village, yes, that's like all the hands, solid. How'd you all fit? <laughs> so yes, lock picking is fun, and I talk a lot about lock picking, and I talk a lot about how locks work. Now, we're not gonna do any lock picking today, but it's important to remember a few things because there's, there's a number of ways that we get into buildings and get into secured spaces and lock picking is seldom among them. So you have a key, right? Here's a key and it's got all these cuts, those are called bidding cuts, and if the bidding is correct, okay, the key will open the lock. Now regarding those bidding cuts, a key, it's not like there's infinite range of like potential cuts. There are a number of discrete manufacturer specified bidding depths. And if, depending on what the depth is, right, like it will or will not work. But being able to figure out what those bidding depths are, it means there, there's not an infinite number of possibilities. You have a number of very specific targets, and if you can recreate those cuts, you can make a key that will work. Now, for example, if you have access to locksmithing software, and we were playing with this for a few minutes downstairs earlier, this is, a, this is the quick set like bidding chart, right? There's only seven potential cut values, really six most of the time. But if you know those cut values, if you have access to a little bit of information about the key, you could recreate that key. And we do that a lot on jobs. Now the best case scenario for this is if you've ever been issued a key, even briefly. Like officially, like, you, hi, I'm here from the copier, I gotta refill your headlight fluid in your Xerox, like, fine, like someone gives you a key for a second. Or if you break into the security office and for like a minute you get the wafer lock open on the key cabinet, you steal a key, and it's physically in your hand. There's a few things you can do at that point. We talked about bidding depths, right? So if you have calipers, and these are, by the way, like the cheapest calipers on Amazon, if you wanna just get a beater set that you throw in your bag and don't care about, so if you take calipers to a key, and this is clearly not a quick set key, right? This is an odd shaped head. What is this? Well, this is a Sargent brand key. Well, we happen to have, you know, Sargent in our locksmithing software. Here we have the key chart for Sargent. Well, if you know the depths, and if you can look at those, and if you can slap a key in some calipers, you can absolutely decode a key this way. In fact, we're gonna do this together. If you don't understand what I mean, we're way up here. We're choked up right near the head of the key. We're on the first bidding position, and this, this caliper is reading 030, or actually 038, okay? So if we look at our chart up here, what bidding depth is this first position? Two. Right, that looks like a two to me. 038, perfect. All right, what's the next position look like to you? Three. 275, what is it? Three. Yeah, that's a depth of three. The next position looks pretty damn similar to me. What do you think? Three. Yeah, I'd call that a three. Now? Yeah, we're back at two. We're walking our way down this whole key. What does this one look like? Yeah, I'd call that a depth of five. And the last position? Exactly, so we've just decoded that key. Now that's using calipers, which is the most universal way, but you've gotta you know, fuss and fart like you're someone in the 50s with a slide rule. If you have a very typical key, most locksmiths will actually have a key gauge. Now, key gauge cards, you don't see Sargent on here. It's common, but not as common as Quickset or Schlage, right? With a key gauge card, you don't have to, you know, like check a chart and do this bullshit. You can just slide, the, you stick the key and slide it till it stops, slide it till it stops, slide it. 
bam, 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 you can just decode that key. And if you have the bidding values of the key, you've got all the time in the world somewhere else as long as you can go, all right, I'm going to get a blank, I'm going to make a key. That's really freaking easy. Now, sometimes you don't even have to do this. Sometimes there are literally visible codes stamped on a key. <laughs> and if you've never seen this, like we've got some numbers here. Let me overlay some bidding charts. Does this maybe look like it might be 86555 or you know 22833 three, like that's the act these are these are called direct bidding codes and they occur on keys more than you might imagine. If you look at keys that you have you might be astounded at how many, I see people reaching in pockets like right now. <laughs> so a lot of keys will have the direct bidding code on them. And I'll, yeah, I'm, winner, right up here. So I, like, I, I dropped in the tool slack. I was like, hey, I need pictures of direct bidding codes. And like, you know, ever, like Brett was like, boom, I got some, like bam. Like so many people. And my favorite was from Scorch. Scorch isn't with us right now. He's in China with DEF CON China. But Scorch is like, hey, I got a direct bidding code photo. It's great. <laughs> OK. Awesome. Don't know why that's there, but sure enough, I was like, is this a joke? Did you Photoshop that? He's like, no, it was an Airbnb. It totally worked. <laughs> now, not every code you will ever see on the outside of something is a direct bidding code. This is an example of packaging that says, you know, oh, it's key to like if you want to buy more of the same. So they're all key to like, right? 48849. Well, this is a Quickset style system. Quickset doesn't have an eight or a nine. This can't be the, the key. This, is, this could not be the key. This is called an indirect code or a blind code, which means it's kind of like a hashing function, right? Like if you have two hashes that match, well, that means they were probably the same password unless you had a weird hash collision, right? So consumers can get the same packaging and like they will all match, but the keys, they don't actually know the direct bidding code unless they measure them with a key gauge or a caliper or unless it's stamped on the key. <laughs> now this, this is 23252. Does that look like a direct or indirect? 2325, that looks like a direct bidding code to me. And the great part is it's visible through the packaging. <laughs> so if you literally find like a piece of trash in someone's you know, like garbage, like, oh look, they just bought brand new locks for this building they were installing. Well, I don't know what this direct, this direct code is. This is an indirect code, but they probably bought it at their local hardware store. So you go to that store, and the way stock shipments work is they're not going to have an infinite number of blind codes. They're usually going to have five or six bidding sets. And in that code series, like you're going to find that blind code on a piece of packaging, and you either buy it for 9 bucks or you flip it over, and you might get lucky enough to see it. And there you go. like You've got someone's key. Now, the, the, the whole thing about, let's say you have a blind code that you don't know what's going on. Like For example, right here, we have this lock. And this key is stamped 3188. That doesn't really look like 3188 exactly to me. Like, yes, this might, maybe that's a one, but I'm not sure. No, this, is, this has got to be a blind code. Okay? That doesn't really help me. And maybe I don't have a piece of trash that I can look up. Maybe I don't know what store they bought this from. Well, again, there is, I showed you locksmith software, right? There's a lot of lookup software. Like this is codes online. This is like lockcodes.com. You can punch that in here. So code 3188, this tells me 6136. Well, let's look back at our key for a second. Wait a minute. What does that look like to you? Does that maybe look like 6136? Absolutely. But that's like on the key. Again, if you have the key, you have a lot of options. It's like that Scorch photo is the funny one where it's stamped on the lock. Like that would just be dumb. Like, oh shit. <laughs> so there's a lot of them stamped on the lock. Yeah, stamping blind codes on locks is a thing that happens. It happens on combination locks. If you've ever seen like the classic gym locker lock, I love showing this one. Older locks are better for this because the older code series are more widely known in a lot of resources. But because if you look on the back here, you might see a stamped or inked series of numbers. All right, so 90, 39, 58, well, locks don't go that high. That, that can't be the real combination. Maybe, that, maybe it's a blind code. It's totally a blind code. There are books like this that exist. There are lookup, like just whole books that are just page after page of lock codes. They are, they are online. 
you can sometimes find these PDFs. People DM me occasionally, and I use I keep a link somewhere that there's like a zip share sketchy site Russia dot whatever domain. <laughs> like you can get a zip file with these kind of books in them. Or again, just get yourself a subscription to Instacode. Instacode is is my preferred locksmithing software. You got a little search box, so let's put that code in the search box. Kachunk! Wow, lots of results. But what brand lock was that? That was a master lock. All right, let's let's go down. Let's find master. What kind of result? Boom! 32, 14, 32. And in case you've never had a locker in school, it literally tells you like which way to dial a lock. Yeah. Bonus, Instacode is a mobile app, so you can have this on your phone. And every time I or Howard or other people give talks, we're like, Instacode's totally getting subscriptions tonight. But yeah, it's like literally nine bucks a month to maintain it, and you get a ton of useful information. Those lock charts, those key bidding charts, even if I'm just impressioning a lock or doing any kind of weird attacks, it's nice to have that as a reference. And I strongly like they're they're a really cool you know, they're a really cool resource. That and lock codes online, any of these exist, and they have existed for a long time. Locksmiths use these, and you can use information like this to make duplicate keys. Now, of course, once you get the code data that you need, you have to turn that into something real, right? So producing a duplicate key, it's not like you just took a key and you left the building and went to the hardware store. Like, If you have a physical key and you either hand it to someone, or nowadays increasingly more and more, like you use an automated machine, right? Having an original key, that is duplication. If you don't have the original, but you have the bidding data, that is known as originating a key. And you can still do that. Like there are machines that will just do, like you can punch in, they're called code cutting machines in many cases. Locksmiths will often charge you more money and they might ask you a couple more questions. Be ready to social engineer. Like you can originate a key just from the code. This is a really nice machine. This is a Silca Futura. I mean, there's manual machines. This is like, I own this little HPC punch. And there's no electricity whatsoever. It is an analog series of little micrometer kind of adjustments. So you can adjust your traverse, you can adjust your plunge. And the way you do different brands of lock is by switching out these blue cards. Because every lock can be expressed as like how far side to side and how far in or out is your bidding position, your bidding depth. We don't have to watch the whole video here, but if you want to see like ka-chunk, it's a giant nipper. So like here we have loaded a card. This looks like a Schlage, and I'm going to cut a Schlage key. And if I've gotten the bidding because I looked it up or I copied the, you know, like the, the photo of the key or I found a blind code or something. So all right, my key lines up this way. Lock the key in. And right under my hands is this little tiny nip jaw. And I'm going to scroll ahead so you can see. All right, so we've got our position. We've, we know what we want. All right, what's our depth? There it is. OK, kerchunk. And little by little, you just nip a bunch of bytes out of this key, almost at the end there. That's the fourth position. My fifth position is what depth? It's a five. Let's scroll over. OK, we're at five depth, kerchunk. And this is a commercial, probably, installation that I was copying. It's six pin. My last depth is one. OK, dial it up to one, kacham. All right, and then you release the key, and like that blank key, one minute later, no sound, no electricity. You can do this like in your car. That's a working key. Like that's a perfectly valid way to do it. We've done this like in in like unused cubicles with something called a pack a punch. This is the smallest possible version of a key code nipper like this. Now again, everything's a trade-off, right? Everything's a trade-off. That whole the original punch, the trade-off is your cuts are a little bit messy. And a really old head locksmith, if you show them a key, they'll be like, that looks like shit. You make this on a punch? Because it's not the same as like a nice clean cutter wheel. This little sucker, this pack a punch, again, I can dial all my depths, I can choose my position, but what's the trade off? The trade off is if you saw there's a letter S on the side, this is Schlage only. You have to choose what brand you're attacking. So my, my, my like, it's super compact, I can throw this in my back pocket, but I better be attacking a Schlage lock if I have this pack a punch, which most of the time in commercial America, a lot of Schlage systems out there. So of course we use these. But it's the same idea. I've got a traverse, and that whole jaw head can, can ratchet up or down based on this little adjustment wheel on the back. And then you'll actually see like little bits of metal like fall out the bottom. 
nip, falls right down. And in the end, you can go nip, nip, nip right through the key. I, these are online. This is the pack of punch is like four hundred some dollars, and it's like Barrett Brockage sells it on Lockpicks.com. Like A1 makes it. It's one of the few things they make really, really perfectly nicely. It's a really great tool. And there you go. This is the same key again, made silently, made like. I've done this literally in bathroom stalls and just like punched little pieces of brass into a sink. And then like, there's my key, it just works. Now, of course, what's the catch in everything you've been seeing so far? You need a blank. Blanks can get weird to source. Keyways can get really complicated depending on how exotic a lock system is. Even mainstream brands that you know. So Schlage, right? Like everyone who's seen a Schlage key has probably seen a Schlage C. Maybe a handful of you have a Schlage E. They're, they're kind of out there, but not much. If you've ever seen an F or a G, that's really freaking rare. I'm, I'd be astonished unless you're in the lock trade if you encounter these with any regularity. And then there's multi-section keys, you know, keyways, and there's multi-section blanks. There is like the super suprema, like works in everything, which we keep on hand. Like we keep a bunch of Schlage Ls, or Kaba Ilko calls them the SC20. We keep those in our field kit because if we ever encounter a Schlage key, even just like a photo, if we make it on an L blank, it's going to work no matter what keyway they're using. That's awesome. Yale. Yale's another example. Like, look at this freaking key blank chart. There's a ton of bizarre key blanks in the world, even for systems you know the name of. Now, if you don't know the name of a system or if you're not sure what they're using, the Ilco uh, key blank directory is really nice to have. Kaba Ilco. It's really cool. They don't just list, and it's all a PDF, by the way. It's, it's available published, but it's also online as a series of PDFs. They don't just list their brands of shit. If you notice, like this is JMA. JMA is a Mexican company that actually sells stuff you sometimes can't find in the US, like reverse Yale keyways when I, like it's a postal restricted key, and I, I got one of those once for a project. And everything is printed to scale. So if you hold a blank up to the page, it'll, it'll be the right size. So as much as you can, there are resources out there to figure out what key you're talking about. And by the way, little tip from me to you, if you have a key in your hands for like one second, trying to do this bullshit, this is a terrible photo. This will not help you. Your teammates will be like, why did you fucking do this? This is awful. <laughs> Get any piece of shit of paper, scrub it, black marker all over it, and stab through the paper. You will take a much better photo, and you'll be able to figure out your key blank later. You will thank me. So all right, you can figure out your key bidding. You can figure out your blank. You either source like a code cutting machine or a pack a punch or something. You're set. What happens if a key blank is complete impossible to find? What happens if there's no branding? You have no idea what this keyway is. You have no idea how to source it. You're like, maybe even if you can, you're sending photos to friends in a signal group, and they're like, wow, are you in Taiwan? That's a Taiwanese lock. You're like, no, I'm in Oklahoma. Can you get me the key? They're like, not this week. How long is your job? Like, if you have no way of getting the blank, that is what we're going to talk about tonight. <laughs> Completely unobtainium blanks. You can't figure out how to get them. You can do a cast and mold attack, right? If you make a mold of a key and then cast it out of metal, it's not that hard. It seems really weird. We're going to try to do it. I'm going to walk you through it. And I brought a ton of freaking metal and clay and weird locks. And for example, like these are, if you see sitting on this table here, we're going to use these in a contest later. This is a nice regular looking padlock, right? But this is not a conventional key you would find. This is, this is a rotating disk system. This is not a key that you're just going to find at Home Depot. So how would you copy something like that? Well, we'll talk about it. So what can we do, right? Well, it literally involves using clay, like modeling clay. You put clay in a little case. You put your key in the clay. You want to make sure the clay releases. So before you put the key in, you put a little bit of powder in there. There's a number of different releasing agents you can use. I just happen to have cornstarch baby powder. I promise it's that, <laughs> right? So you rub, rub a little powder on there. You got your key. Cram that key in extra hard. Pop it out. So what do you have now? You have a nice negative mold of this key. Usually the very top will be you know, as, as narrow and tight as the key. That's a little hard if you're about to pour a bunch of hot metal in a super thin slot. So what people will often do, and you'll see me do this. I'm going to try to do this live. I could train wreck the hell out of this. You never know. But fuck it, live demos, right? 
So some people, exactly. Fuck it, do it live. <laughs> Fucking thing sucks. <laughs> so you, many people will make like a little thumbprint to make kind of a funnel, to make it a little bit easier to pour the metal in. By the way, when you're pouring metal in, you want the metal to settle all the way in. You'll see I advocate strongly drawing a little vent. So this is just me using a lock pick, and I'm actually just drawing this little sort of snorkel vent so that the air inside the mold has a place to escape out. Put that mold back together. Uh, sometimes you know, I'll use a big clamp like this, or if you just have little binder clamp, like little clips, that's fine too. Anything so that you're not, your hands aren't on the mold while you're pouring hot metal in the shit. But yeah, uh, a little cigar torch lighter is not mandatory. It's what I'm going to use, but you can use a regular Bic lighter. That's fine. Here we have our mold ready. We've got our lighter ready. We just need metal, right? So the metal we use is a low melting point alloy. There's a number of low melt point alloys out there. This one melts at around, I think it's about 158 degrees, something like that. So any kind of lighter, you can get your, your alloy to melt down. Try not to let it start gassing off. Like this is full of a lot of compounds you don't want to breathe or get on you. It's, so this is wood's metal. I don't know if anyone does arts and crafts. Uh, wood's metal has lead in it, has cadmium in it. It's got a lot of things that are generally not an LD50 you want to screw with. So just don't, you know, don't, like, don't have food and drink on the surface where you're doing it. You know, and you should be fine. Once you've got it liquid, you pour that in, bloop, and you'll see it go right in, and just, just tap, 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 let it settle, and just let it sit. It needs, I'm going to say on a good day, five minutes, but sometimes if you really press for time, you can go a little quicker. Hopefully, if we just tell jokes and do Q&A shit, I will actually let it sit still and let it harden all the way before I try to take it out. That's because I'm way too enthusiastic most of the time. But if it all hardens up perfectly and you pop it out, like there you go. You might have a little bit of that trail hanging off the end from that snorkel, but that you can just knock that off with a finger or you know, shave it down with a hand file or anything like that. And it is, it's hard enough that it should operate most locks. Like if it's a deadbolt that really needs a lot of torque, sometimes we'll play around with carving a little hollow in the key and throwing a lock pick turning tool in. So the key sets the bidding, the turning tool made of steel is what you're wrenching on the deadbolt with. But most of the time, like bam, you're there. That'll work. Not infinitely forever. Again, like in this case, Woods Metal or Cerro Safe, Cerro Bend, these are they're strong enough, but you wouldn't want to use them infinitely. One one dude, he I showed this to some people and he was like, oh that's so cool. I own this abloy lock and it's got these the keys are like $28 to copy a key. I'm just gonna do this. I'm like, like forever? He's like, yeah, I don't need it. I was like, I really wouldn't do that. Like the, the $28 key is one thing. It's a $150 lock. And if you trash the key in it, like break it off. Like, dude, pay the 28 bucks. How did you buy the lock in the first place? <laughs> but yeah, I really love this tactic if you have a weird ass key. If you have weird rotating disc mechanisms like we have here, for example. These are not common in America. We do encounter them on overseas jobs. And we've absolutely done, you know, just cat, like mold and cast attacks because that's all we got. I don't have time to go like find a local locksmith and bribe him or something and like get blanks that I'm not supposed to have. So if you want to do this at home, I'm a big proponent of like open source the shit out of anything you know and give it away. Uh, the Woods Metal, you can find a lot of it online. You can find these huge block ingots. They're not useful in this giant slab size. What you do is you take a little like cup that you don't care about and don't do this when you're cooking dinner, obviously, because you should keep this away from food. But yeah, you melt that sucker down. And what I bought is I bought these little silicone, tiny, tiny, teeny ice cube tray things uh, because they like to make ice cubes to go in water bottles. And I was like, is this going to destroy this? No, it doesn't destroy this. Awesome. Yay, silicone. So like, yeah, just pour this into your silicone mold and let it sit, let it harden. And it takes a while to cool because it's a lot. It's a very, very thermally dense material. It's a very dense metal. Once it's cooled, you pop all that shit out of there. Some of them are perfect cubes, some of them are not. You take the ones that aren't perfect, you remelt them, and you keep on keeping on, right? So you can make yourself a ton of these. And it turns out most keys really only need about one of these cubes uh, most of the time, especially for really thin American-style keys. These big fat ones that I'm going to do, I might use a second cube. But yeah, you can make a bazillion of these little cubes for not a lot of money. Uh, yes, you got, oh, where do I get the tray? Yeah, there you go. Oh, dude, everything's fucking online. Everything's on the Amazon. 
the clay. Um, it needs to be polymer clay. Uh, squeak, earlier you were like, oh man, I do stuff with kids. Like, you know Sculpey. Sculpey clay is it's, it's going to work really well. It's not going to fall apart under liquid conditions or heat conditions. It will start to, because this is an oven fired clay, right? It will start to harden. If you use this clay, you can't like infinitely reuse it and remake it. You can remake more than one key, but you can't mash it up forever and keep remaking more and more. Like, it's cheap, right? Like, it's, it's goddamn 15 bucks for 10 of these goddamn things. Just, you all make a good living. Buy more. This is the cheapest lead ladle we've ever found, although somebody at a, another con I was at, he showed me it was like a gravy spoon or something that he found on Amazon that was cheaper than this. I was like, wow, $4 gravy spoon, right on. It was, it was sure, just don't mix it up with the silverware at home. <laughs> the most expensive thing you're going to see me use is this cigar lighter, which is the least necessary thing. If you've got time, a regular, like, stand there for four or five minutes with a lighter, like, it'll get it cooking. But the cigar lighter works very fast. And then these trays, uh, so yeah, I just had a rough idea of what I wanted because they, there's various clamshell trays, and they're all way too expensive online. And number like Lockmaster sells them, uh, German company sells them. But I was in the tool channel, and I was like, here, somebody, I suck at 3D modeling, but what if we did this? And Jimmy Longs and I batted some ideas back and forth. He designed this, uh, Matt Burroughs like, printed it, and we had a bunch of these at Lockfest. If you want to try it, I brought like, all this shit. I brought enough for people to, to check it out. If you ever do this, again, Woods metal isn't great to handle. I have gloves. I'm probably not going to use them because fuck it, I'm old. I'm dying one day. Um, <laughs> woods metal, like woods metal, has lead in it. It has cadmium in it. These are not thing. Most most low melt point alloys will have some stuff in them you don't want. The only one that really exists that is safe is Fields metal, and it's much more expensive because Fields metal has indium. So you can get Fields metal online. In fact, some tool people in the Slack, like somebody. Try, I think Flay or somebody like bought Fields Metal. He's like, I hope this is correct. This is some crazy Chinesium shit. And he and Christina did a melt point test. And they're like, hey, I think it's actually Fields Metal. Good job. Safe to handle. Me, I just you know, don't like put it in your drinks or something. <laughs> so who want, how about we try this? Should we try this for a second? How are we doing on time? <laughs> All right. We're only like 40 minutes in. We're looking pretty good. Let me swing this camera around so it looks a little more normal-like. All right. So here we go. We've got, uh, yeah, OK. Just put that over there. <laughs> which key is which? OK. So we have a couple of these weird rotating disk lock keys, right? And let's say we want to copy that. I'm just going to kind of like Tony Bennett at this, this hour of the evening. Exactly. So it's hard to find blanks for these because, again, like these are from Malaysia or something. I don't freaking know. But we've got clay. We've got a little mold. If you buy the Sculpey stuff, the, one of the biggest problems people have is too much shit, too much clay, too much metal. They, they have these little four bangers in here. Just break off a single log. That is all you need. And you, really, like, you can split this in half, and that's more than enough to fill up absolutely both of these channels. So we're going to kind of do this. And if you have questions, like I can kind of answer questions if you shout them out or something. So how legal, is this? how legal is this? I mean, if you're allowed to copy the key, it's probably very legal. If you're not as allowed to, like, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> technically, I think it's like copying the key isn't illegal. Just opening the door is illegal if you're not supposed to, right? So yeah. Fun fact, there are a handful of keys that are actually restricted by code. If you, like People always talk to me about um, Howard and I have done the lock, elevator lock talk, right? So there are certain keys that are actually restricted by statute that unless you are an authority having jurisdiction, you're not officially supposed to have certain like fire keys or something like that. So I'm just going to, yeah. Will this work on automotive keys? Yes, but the opportunity cost is much higher if it doesn't play nice in the lock. So yeah, like if you have a, um, by the way, if you're ever doing any monkey business with a car, right, like you know, use the passenger door. Don't use the driver's side door, because if you bone it, well, who cares? Like it's the lock you never usually use a key in. So we got our little, I swear this is not cocaine bullet officer. So 
Uh, I've done an Abloy Protec with this. Protec 1, not Protec 2, because they have the little interactive element. That's one way to not, I mean, defeat this completely, but make it meaning, meaningfully not practical, would be to have an interactive element on the key, which is a little floating element, like a ball bearing or something. Anything that moves, anything with a magnet. If you've seen Miwa keys from Japan, if you've seen like the MCS by Eva, which is a uh, Austrian brand, like you're not going to meaningfully duplicate that well. But this is, I mean, this is all just a solid piece of metal. It's exotically shaped, right? But it's just a piece of metal. Now, do you think I want to like mash down really hard? No, no. I want to just see how it's slipping around on the on the the powder. I want to just give it a little what for, just so it's not slipping around. It'll it'll just stay still long enough that I can line this up. Now, I could just crush this with my hand alone. What I like to do, honestly, is just kind of stand on it really fast. And you're going to get a lot of like smooshy action with the clay. That's OK. Is that a term? Yes, it is exactly. <laughs> oh, really cool question. Have I ever tried casting with a turner tool in the mold? No, because that would artificially make it wider than it needs to be. What I have done, so when I talked about, there we go. I don't want to disturb the mold when I pop it out, so I do that. When I talked about making a little bit of extra space, you would actually take a pinch of clay and put it back in the mold so that it's artificially not there. Oh, no, no. Casting, not, not taking the liquid part. Oh, oh, when the metal goes in. Yeah. Uh, no, that's an interesting question. It would almost maybe put the Turner tool like very affixed to it. That's a really neat idea. I've never tried it. Uh, maybe we'll do that one time. Can we do that later? Yeah, let's, by all means. So this looks pretty good to me. I mean, it's, I don't know how, how well we can see this. It's, oh, wow, super fucking blown out. Here, let's, um, did it work? Yeah. Like, this has some potential. And again, we want to have just a little vent. We want to have a. Do not copy on your key means. <laughs> what does. So that's a really good point, right? If you have a key and it says do not duplicate, that is. is well, it has no legal bearing for the most part. For the most part, locksmiths. <laughs> um, locksmiths will honor do not duplicate because typically when a locksmith orders blank for, for their shop, uh, they will order blanks that will often come with what they call a neuter bow. Even if you get a Schlag or a quick set, it has this larger, blocky shaped bow on the top. And will often have their branding on one side, their contact info, and do not duplicate on the back. Most locksmiths will honor do not duplicate in the same way that they expect other locksmiths to honor theirs. Uh, there's no legal basis for it whatsoever. There's, no one will get in trouble for like duplicating a do not duplicate key. It is just, yeah, you just, exactly. And like if you ever have a key that says do not duplicate, you literally just like get, I've been in Home Depot right. where they said, hey, you won't, we, we can't do this. It says, we do not make these. And I'm like, okay, sorry, sorry, don't mean to bother you. Uh, those little rubber key covers, that they're, they're $9.99, all right, can I buy a pack of them? And like, you know, have my buddy come back five seconds later, and he's like, this is the key to my grandma's attic. She's dead. I really miss her. I'm crying. Can you make my key? Like, <laughs> and it's got a little rubber cover over it, so they're not freaking reading it. Yep, yeah, fire is doing fiery things. Fire. Now, this, the actual metal spoon itself fire. will have a lot of uh, heat absorption. So you don't need to, you, to apply fire until it's completely melted. Right about here, I'm probably going to cut my flame off. And it's perfectly enough to be very, very liquid. I don't know if that's coming through on camera. Oh, man, we're coming through. It's fucking bullshit. There we go. Now, this is really clamped on hard, but we're going to try it. Oh, we got a little leakage. Oh, we might have, let's see what happened there. We might have leaked out the side. Yeah, that didn't look good. So let's check, um, let's check what happened. We can probably reuse the mold and the metal. Oh, interesting. It actually leaked out a side. Oh, wow. Okay, so you see what happened here? No. It leaked. No. no. Oh, my God. Here, hang on. Yeah. So what happened is the little sort of snorkel that I made was so far out of the lane 
that it came down and it leaked out one of these side vents. These vents, some people like these side vents for, um, for yeah, for expansion. I honestly, let me see this. If I just, if I just close this off, and remember, I'm using my gloves to stay very, very safe right now, of course. <laughs> yep, yep. I'm just going to try to remelt and just, so you can see this side got a little bit of metal on it. If you remelt and put it in there, will it be enough to melt maybe some of that other stuff and then put it out? Which, which stuff melt where? That was a lot of non-specific dangly modifiers. <laughs> ah, yes. So it was a little hard to see on camera. The one side that has some metal has almost none. It has like a dusting of metal, uh, barely any. Am I still looking good on the camera there? Now maybe this works, maybe it, maybe it doesn't. I know, right? Well, it didn't leak out. Was it warm on the tray? A little warm. Like I knew, I knew there had been heat applied. <laughs> uh, it wasn't enough to burn me. Right now, this is concentrated. This is a concentrated mass, and it's liquid. So that's that's up there. Can you know. Quench it inside an insulator. What's that? Could you just quench the whole thing? Could you quench it? That's an interesting question. Um, I've never tried that. Like in the toilet, right there. <laughs> in the in the glass. True. Um, it's funny too because these molds that people like the actual tray, uh, people used to make them out of metal, and they were like, "Oh, because it acts as a heat sink." I'm like, "I don't really think so. I think that clay is kind of an insulator." I see a hand. Yes. Really cool question. The question was: Some states view lock picks differently under the law. Not as many states as we think. Um, there are four states of concern: so Virginia, Mississippi, Ohio, and Nevada. Those states, lock picks are not illegal. They are considered potentially evidence of your criminal intent, unless you have an explanation as to why you own them. They're not like go directly to jail. Uh, Tennessee is also a state that, as I'm wiping my mucous membranes with fucking lead, uh, <laughs> Tennessee is also a state that's a little questionable. I, I like to. Someone said, you know, is this illegal to have? Like, I like to think it's not. It's not an entry tool unless you've made a key out of it. Like, until then, it's just clay and some three D printed resin. Uh, I've never tested that in court, sir. Yes, question. Uh, if you quenched it, would you worry, be worried about it breaking? Would I worry about it breaking if I quenched it? Um, I, in general, as you pointed out, like quenching is a very uh, violently arresting process, and it causes metal to do different things. In fact, Wood's metal, and especially Field's metal, has a small expansion coefficient when it hardens, and I don't know how well that would play if it was rapidly hardened or quenched. Um, I mean, we could try that. Like, by all means, we got enough stuff here. I brought a lot of parts and a lot of clay and a lot of things. So let's exhaust all the possibilities. Yes, sir. I do. Dr. Tran, help me out here. This, the refill has to do with a contest that we'll talk about in a little bit here, because there is a special. There's a challenge. Who was at WhiskeyCon? Who was not at WhiskeyCon? Dr. Tran, put that bottle up here for a second. So we brought a number of of things to WhiskeyCon. <laughs> And if you're interested in the chance to sample some things that are hard to find, in fact, that's we thank you. Uh, we here's here's the challenge that we have, right? During the party afterward, which is at the second floor bar, is that correct? Somebody, is that where the party is? In the lobby bar. In the lo is the lobby is downstairs. Oh, the first night before, yeah, the first night bar. So the the first floor bar down by the. All right. There is this little box that I've made. Okay, this box can perfectly hold a glass. So the glass is going to go in the box. A pour of Pappy will go in the glass. The, gla the glass will then get closed in the box, and we will use one of these you know, hard-to-source-the-blanks-for locks. Now, we tried this in the room. Even if this demo train wrecks, we made this work. So we are going to let anyone who can try to make a key, if you can get the key to work, you can unlock the box, you can have the drink. 
and we'll keep on going until we've exhausted this bottle. Yeah, so the hotel stops us. So let's see. This is warm, but not like hurting me. So I'm going to say it might be in good shape. Uh, which key do we, we use this key? Which this key was probably this lock? Other lock. No, I think it was the other lock? It was supposed to be the other lock, but it was that lock. Really? All right, well, yeah, we'll take a look. I don't know how we're doing on camera. That looks kind of like this key to me. <laughs> All right, let me let me drop her down a little bit there. So that looks pretty goddamn good. The hardest part when taking this out is I don't want to crack the key because it's got this weird stress concentration the way this is designed. Now, of course, we got this little nib on the front tip, and this is a tip-stopped key, so we want to make sure it fits all the way in the lock. But let's see. It feels like it's in there. Feels like it's not quite all the way in there. Oh! Oh no! Wait a minute. No, we're gonna fix this. Hang on, we got it out. We're gonna we got it out. We're gonna we're gonna redo it one more fucking time because who cares? I'm the last talk. Is Woods Metal magnetic? So as far as I can tell, there's nothing ferrous in Woods Metal. All right. Do we want to try it one more time? How are we doing on time? I feel like this is kind of an important thing to talk about, and, and not, enough, um, not enough talks really mention this. Like, I've had a lot of people come up to me at this con and say, like, oh, man, like you and Howard and Tran and everybody and, like, Patrick with the Lockpick Village, like, I love all the shit you do, and it's so cool. Like, most of the stuff I do doesn't work the first time or the second. Like, a lot of shit won't work really well for you like that this is this is hacking hacking is not oh my god two people typing on the same keyboard we're awesome like <laughs> hacking is mostly like doing dumb stuff that doesn't work until it does so you know maybe this is going to work this time maybe it's not i think the key didn't get far enough in the last time i did it um, i will actually probably reach into my pick set and just have a file at the ready in case uh, i need to file the tip off but yeah, like everybody who's ever yes, question in the back. Do you, so that's a really that's a fun point, and that's like that's a larger conversation to have at the bar or something. The question was, so should we all change our locks now? Like ultimately, no, um, for a number a variety of reasons. Not not the least of which is that most people are fundamentally good. Um, the world isn't a really dangerous place. Not what the news or other people would have you believe. Like. Most people who do you harm aren't doing you like, this takes a lot of skill to learn and a lot of investment of time and material. Most people who are bad people are doing really obvious dumb things. They're using bolt cutters and bricks. If you really have a resource that you care about, and this is, I've talked about this in other talks, that there are, there are kind of symbolic locks that just represent, hey, this is my shed please don't come in here, you don't belong in here. And that's you know your hardware store master multi-numbered combination bullshit lock. That, that's, that's not really gonna keep anyone out, right? There's a billion bypasses for it. But if someone is ever in that room, like that's a commitment that they've made. They've made the commitment to say, I am disregarding this barrier and I'm, like they know they're doing wrong. So that's a symbolic lock. You can have residential grade security, which is probably fine for most of your situations, and then you have a security situation where you have a very important high value resource. And if you have a really important resource, well, that's, you know, like our lives are consulting about this kind of shit, right? There are expensive, very intricate solutions that will resist a variety of intricate finesse based attacks. And if you need that level of security, sure, like it's out there. Um, but the, the bigger thing in the world for me is not, it's not scary to me that this kind of attack exists. It's scary to me that people think they need more security than they really need and they waste. Right. If you're not threat modeling, if you're preparing for the wrong threat, you're, you're throwing good money after bad. And I don't know, like there, there's money can be better spent in this world. Yeah. Yes. So there was a question about number push button locks, which is kind of a broad statement, and combination locks. You said electronic combination locks. 
Oh, so like uh, if you were staying in Airbnb, where like everyone's Airbnb nowadays is some kind of keypad based lock. Um, some of them are good, some of them aren't. Most of them have a traditional mechanical cylinder uh, for their override, which ironically, Quickset, who's got like the market, like the Kivo, right? Like all their shit, their, all their systems, their, their fallback cylinder is the Quickset smart key, which is actually not easy to pick. Uh, there's a decode for it. So Farmer Freak made a tool years ago, and then Lockmasters weaponized it. It's a little optic tool. Our friend Shane, he made a, a manual decoder tool. So you can decode the smart key, but it's not easy to pick at all. You need to have done your homework. Uh, so yeah, do I think that... I don't like the idea that more and more people are getting complacent about the idea that, well, technology is more gooder because it's got the ones and zeros. <laughs> like mod modernity for modernity's sake undermines a lot of security. It's why we see a lot of unnecessary electronic lock upgrades in corporate America and corporate space. For a home user, like if you got a keypad lock and you get, you know, like I think the threat model there is if your kid is six and, and they keep losing the key at school, that's probably the bigger risk than just putting this weird keypad lock on. So again, as, as Lisa points out, it's threat modeling. How are we doing here? We're going to only try this this one last time. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, who gives a shit? <laughs> yes, you, talk to me. Have, you gotten arrested on the job? have I ever gotten arrested on the job? No. Um, I have never actually gotten like proper caught on the job. The most caught we've ever gotten has been a job where we were instructed specifically to go loud, like really loud, like we destroyed doors. Um, and that still didn't, they didn't, like, I'm going to give a talk in New Orleans uh, in June uh, about this, and, like, they still didn't actually stop us. So at some point, I just started doing stupid shit. Like, I stole a security cart, and I drove it around, and I stole, <laughs> and, like, they started following me, and I just, but, like, a golf cart can go places a car can't. So, like, six mobile units are trying to follow me through parking lots and through, like, then I took a bike. Um, and in the end, the guy, would, like, eventually I stopped, because everyone on my team is like, hey, like we, we, they finally, they, call, they figured out, they think something's up, just let's end the, end the exercise. <laughs> yeah. It was really cool because everyone else on the team was getting into other places. It was only when a supervisor, you're getting the preview of my Sans talk, a supervisor came in from off-site and he was like, bike guy may be a distraction. Cancel all guard, guard tours, <laughs> stop touring, like get downstairs. Well, this is still really hot. I'm going to let that cool off. Um, yeah, and they, then eventually they're like, we're like, all right, they pretty much know what's up. Like, everyone just let you just let yourself get caught. So we get, you know, I got caught, I got stopped, I took off the bike, and I sat, and the guy's like, I need you to stop going anywhere right now, because they've been like driving around this parking lot. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not going anywhere, the bike's there, what do you want from me? And I just so calm, and he was so, he was ready to like tackle me. And I, the fact that I was like, what do you want? What do you need? I'm fine. Is there something wrong, sir? <laughs> He's like, what do you actually do? Did you just drive around? And, like, did you take a cart? I'm like, yeah, was I not supposed to take a cart? I thought they were for anybody. <laughs> uh, but then you talk through, and then, the, then I was like, he's like, well, I think you need, to have a, you need to have a conversation with LE. They're on their way. And I was like, okay. Would it, would it upset any of you if I reached into my pocket? Because I'm going to give you something. Uh, and I was like, you know, you always ask because you never, I mean, I'm, I'm white. So like, let's all imagine <laughs> it's probably okay. But I was like, you should probably just take a look at this. And I gave him the, it wasn't even the real letter, because we travel with the fake letter, which says, like, this is a test. It, it, believe everything this person says. And, you know, he was like, he looked at his partner. He's like, we were right. It's an exercise. I was like, all right, should I go? He's like, no, don't go. We have to still talk to someone. Like, right. But yeah, that was, that was about the closest my, our team ever got. And that was after, like, a, a lot of crazy, crazy crap. So if, I don't know if we can see on camera the tip of this key you can almost see there's a lot of little flashing way out at the tip of this key that would keep it from going all the way in. But I'm going to try just to use my little impressioning file. And if it works, it works. This Again, this shouldn't be a discouragement for anyone to try. This should be an encouragement for any of you to go ahead and try this later. <laughs> So remember, don't don't do what Donnie don't does. Don't start drinking and eating, and like you don't want like harmful chemicals in your food if you go get late night snacks. 
Don't go back to the CTF room and start like coding. You don't want poison on your laptop keyboard. Nobody fucking needs that. Um, yes, it just try, please try this. I'm going to stick around. We got more questions, but in general, just thank you for, for listening. Thank you.